everybody you guys getting ready to get into the unknown do a little do a little squatchy stuff tonight we've got a good show for you tonight so let me get on the network hey everybody hope you're doing well are you guys ready to uh, get into the unknown tonight the unknown file show is coming up so I'm gonna go ahead and get ready let's just go ahead and start and uh, get into it tonight Welcome to this week's edition of the Unknown File Show with Outdoors Dan. Hope everyone's having a great Wednesday night on this March 1st, 2023. Thanks to everybody downloading and listening to the Outdoor Call Radio app. Morning, uh, afternoon, evening, Steve. Hello, Rick. <laughs> Everybody's getting all excited. Got the stream going on Facebook, and uh, we're going to have fun. Gary Peck, good evening there, my buddy up in uh, Minnesota. Hope you're doing well. We're going to have a little fun tonight. We're going to be talking uh, with a, a gentleman that's written a really nice book on Bigfoot Influencers. So I'm going to go ahead and get him on the line. Hey, let me tell you real quick. The show is brought to you in part by our good friends out at Revelton Distillery, official spirit, the outdoors unknown show, unknown foil show, I must say. Thanks to Rob and Christy and everybody down, Hank, and everybody down at Revelton. All right, let me go ahead and get this on. We'll get our guest on, and we'll get cranking. <laughs> we're, what's up, Eric? Yeah, we're talking Bigfoot tonight, Eric. Yeah. You know, Bigfoot would do better if they had Luminox, man. Absolutely. Hello? Tim, it's Outdoors Dan. You're on the Unknown Files show. What's going on? Uh, um, everything's good, Dan. Uh, glad to be here. Oh. We just want to make sure our connection was, is good right now. Can you hear me okay? Well, I can hear you. Let me see. Testing. One, two, three. Testing. Testing. You good? Yeah, well, you're probably better off if you don't hear me, but that's all right. <laughs> we'll just get, we'll get through it. How, where are you at tonight? Uh, I'm in uh, southern Delaware on the on the east coast. Ooh, I'm jealous, man. Seafood city, good for you. Yeah, definitely. We definitely have a plethora of uh, of options here. There's water all around, no matter what you want. How's uh, how's the soft shell crab right now? We're out of season. Nah. You know, so we, yeah. Yeah. We, I mean, you could probably find them hibernating or, you know, but yeah, we're a little, little early yet. Yeah. Hey, Hank, how's it going? Hank says Sasquatch is watching. I hope so. Uh, we like, we like to get squatchy here on the Unknown File Show. Uh, yeah, hey, I, don't think, I don't think we have any here though. In Delaware, so. <laughs> I don't know. I got, I can look it up real quick. Hey, uh, let me tell you who Tim is. Tim is the author of the Bigfoot book and book, Bigfoot Influencers. He, uh, he is, uh, has a plethora of, you like that big word there, Hank? Plethora of uh, uh, folks that are into the uh, into the uh, Bigfoot spectrum. Dr. Jeff Muldrum, who uh, is a very well-known biologist out there in, out there in the West, uh, Survivor Man, Les Stroud, Peter. Uh, is it? Help me out on that, uh, Tim. Is it P Peter Barney? Peter Burn. 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 I don't want to mispronounce Mr. Burn's name. Mark DeWirth and uh, Thomas Steenberg and Kathy Strain, just to name a few. And if you want to go check this book out, it's uh, a really good read. It's got QR codes in it, and uh, this is a volume one of the series, and I encourage you to go check it out. We're going to be talking a little Squatch stuff tonight. Man, I love uh, I love the pictures you sent with your bio. Good pictures. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I think I have a face for radio, but, uh, you know. No, I don't, I don't be stealing my line. Don't be stealing my line. <laughs> Tim's also in, uh, in, uh, in the Bigfoot Influencers podcast, which airs weekly and continues to explore and deeper dive into the phenomenon. Tim and Dana's goals through the conservations conversations with each guest. You know, Tim, I really need to get reader glasses. I've been putting it off, and I keep I'm, I'm going to have to get them one of these days. Conversations with each guest are to help educate the audience while providing a welcoming atmosphere. Each episode is entertaining and fun, and they don't mind asking tough or controversial questions. And this was uh, the Crypto Zoo News. Uh, help me out with that. Hominology? Hominology? Yes. Like a hominid? Yes. Yeah, Book of the Year of 2022. And Squatch DTV Book of the Year of 22. Congratulations, Tim. 
Thank you. It's humbling. It definitely it's an interesting story how it started, but it's definitely uh, you didn't know how to be here. And side note, I, I put my readers on for this. Uh, <laughs> Did you? You know, I had LASIKs done like 25 years ago, and the guy the guy that I went to, this is when they first started doing LASIKs, and the guy messed it up. I went from being nearsighted to farsighted, and he forgot to he forgot to adjust for my astigmatism. But what he did is he made me, uh, I could see my near vision, I'm sorry, my far vision, I still needed a small corrective lens. I, I couldn't wear contacts anymore. That was the bad thing. I had, to, I had to wear glasses, but my lenses were super thin. But the, the nice thing about him messing up is I, I, I can still see my hand at five, six inches in front of my face. Um, so, you know, unless I'm reading small type, I'm usually okay. But uh, anyway. I'm the opposite. How's that? How's that affect your you being out in the woods? I uh, just, I just, yeah. You know, well, it stinks because I, if it's cold, my glasses are always fogging up on me. So I'm constantly having to clean them, or you know, not wear like a neck gaiter. I love wearing a neck gaiter when it's cold because it keeps you, you know, it keeps you warmer. But uh, you just, uh, it's, it's not good. And when you, and I do a lot of self filming on the TV show, so you know, there's a lot of little things I have to take my glasses off every once in a while just to make sure my camera settings are where they need to be so I can see my peaking or my zebras on the screen and make sure everything's in focus and the the the, uh, the color balances are where they need to be. But other than that, it's, it's okay. I mean, I can still see relatively good for being 59. So Right. I'm a, hey, I'm only a couple years behind you. And you know what you should do, Dan, is you should get some of those lens wipes because they're anti-fog and you should you should crank this on your glasses. I, you know what? I've tried them and I've tried taking other stuff and it just, you know, t with that AR coating on the, on the glasses, it just Oh yeah. It just hit, it, for some reason it just but it, hey, listen, if that's the only thing I've got to complain about Tim, I'm doing okay. <laughs> yeah, as long as you still climb a tree, right? Yeah, absolutely. Tony, good to see you. Eric, my buddy at Luminox, Mr. Price, if you haven't if you don't have Luminox on your arrows, you're messing up. Bigfoot loves seeing them in the forest. I'm telling you, they light up the whole forest. Uh, Chris Hall, good to see you. Russell, thank you for joining us tonight on Facebook Live. We appreciate everybody. Thank you. So, all right, got to get into this. What got you into Bigfoot, Tim? Uh, well, it's an um, interesting story. I think at least to me it's interesting. I'm not much audience, but I wasn't, you know, I never was really, I, I was always, like all of us, I think, watched In Search Of and some of those shows. Um, Monster Quest as I got a little older uh -huh. but you know saw the Patterson Gimlin film you know that was taken in 1967 but it really was just like a thing like hey that's kind of cool you know you know we'd move on with life and and then my, you know my, my wife was always into it and her and our son Gabriel used to watch Finding Bigfoot and, you know I guess starting in around 2000s or ish I guess that's when that show came out yeah and um she finally convinced me. She goes, "Hey, let's go to a Bigfoot conference." And I thought she was a little crazy. I'm like, "What?" You know, but I knew she was into it. Yeah. So I'm open minded, and I thought it was cool. And and we we uh, I said, "Sure, let's do it." And I didn't know what I was walking into because we'd never been to one of these. We didn't know how to dress, didn't know, just didn't know what to expect. Um, so uh, we went to a conference in Ohio, um, the Ohio Bigfoot Conference, which is one of the you know one of the long standing one. I think they're going into 35th year of having conferences in a, a Bigfoot conferences in Ohio, which is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I went to one of these conferences. Uh, we met some really cool people. The organizer of the event, his name's Mark DeWorth. Um, he saw us, we got there early. Actually, you mentioned uh, Dr. Jeff Meldrum. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, who's a, a, a studies a, a, a professor of anatomy. And he uh, he actually happened to be checking in the hotel at the same time I was, and we were, and just kind of started kind of just having a, a, a light conversation with him, and you know just kind of cracking up with him because I didn't care. Well, you know, I had I just knew he was this guy named he's been on TV a couple times, you know, so yeah. it didn't matter to me. <laughs> so, well, you know, uh, he, you know yeah. what, and I don't mean to step on you. He's no, he, he's really one of the uh, one of the really serious. I mean, he's he is a real P, uh, PhD biologist. I mean, he's uh -huh. he's an accredited uh, accredited scientist, and he's one of the few that have come out and just say, you know, I, the stuff that I've been seeing since the six, six, late sixties and seventies, 
this stuff with the the anatomy of the of the castings on the feet, he's saying that these these things, the abnormal uh, the abnormalities, these things can't be faked. Now, now today, he uh, I'm seeing stuff where they're saying now people with uh, 3D printers and stuff of that technology, you could kind of fake a lot of this stuff. But going back to the early late 60s and early 70s. That technology uh, wasn't available, so he said that was the turning point for him. That he knew something, mm-hmm. something was out, something was not right. It something was going on that they they wanted to look in. And you know, he was one of the one of the very first real scientists to come out because most people in that line of work, you know, they avoid this like the plague because they don't want to they don't want to get the scrutiny or the uh, you know they don't they uh, what's the word I'm looking for, Tim? When people. Uh, they don't want uh, criticism, maybe. Well, the criticism, uh, the criticisms, yeah, and stuff like that. The, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, and 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 Jeff Meldrum, he's, uh, you know, he he's, I guess, back in the nineties, yeah. you know, he and he studies what his specialty is: bipedal locomotion. Right. So he studies how animals walk and 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 their 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 prints, and that's what he does. And he was. Um, he got the baton unofficially passed on to him to from a, a gentleman by the name of Dr. Grover Krantz, who uh, was uh, also at Washington. He's at Washington State University, and he he st- he wrote a book, and he studied this. He was maybe the first. Uh, he was the, the the academic face of Bigfoot, you know, going back to the before Dr. Jeff. And passed it on. And there's other academics, and you'd be surprised. There's just quite a few PhDs that some of them, you know, won't come out and say it in public. But there's 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 a few, and it's it's kind of growing. But he passed the baton to Dr. Jeff Meldrum, and he's uh, and one one of the things he told me, uh, because obviously I interviewed him in the book and on the podcast, is he's in the '90s. He 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 uh, was visiting uh, a gentleman by by the name of Paul Freeman. Mm-hmm. Who is controversial name? Uh, be, you know, he was, and, and uh, you know, some folks think that he over exaggerated some things. Um, others think he did not, and he said a lot of things that most think that's very, very credible, and maybe has the second most compelling video in existence. Of, uh, I, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, that was yeah. the gentleman. Uh, he was out on the West Coast, right? Yeah, Walla Walla. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I've I've seen some stuff. And you know, hey, I, I got a couple new listeners tonight. They're saying hi, and they say, they say this is great, and I appreciate that. And listen, everything we're talking about tonight, we're just we're having conversations. And I, I, I uh, Tim and I had a conversation before the show. I called him earlier, and we were talking. I've grew up with this stuff. I mean, I I've always loved and was fascinated with the stories, and uh, you know, just kind of going through and seeing. The stuff that we used to watch on TV and reading books, and uh, you know, Dr. Lauren Coleman, I, he had some fascinating books I read when I was uh, in the service. Actually, I was reading them when I was in the service. But uh, you know, we we can't. I don't know if there's anything exactly out there, and I've never seen anything. I've never heard anything. But the thing about this show, Tim, what I like about it, I'm talking with people that have a fascination with this phenomenon, and. You, you know, we're if people are willing to explore to see if we can get a definitive answer because there's not a definitive yes, there is, and there's not a definitive no, there's not. I mean, either way, there's no proof. Am I saying well, that? Am I saying that fairly? You are saying that fairly, and, and Lauren Coleman's actually one one of the individuals that actually was a, a huge help with the book. He's in yeah. the book, and uh, he's yeah, he's he's like the. Uh, the uh, godfather of cryptozoology. <laughs> so, yeah. And he has his own museum, uh, uh, which, uh, you know, can, uh, two of them actually in Maine. Is he, is he still, is he still with us? Oh yeah. Yeah. Lauren's with us. He's, he's not, he, yeah, he's not as old as you think. Okay. He's, he's got, um, he, he's got a museum. It's called the international cryptozoology museum. Mm-hmm. And, uh, he's got one in Portland, Maine and one in Bangor, Maine. And, uh, I'm actually gonna, he's got a conference coming up in May that I'll be speaking at on about books. So I'm really excited to do that. Okay. Well. So, yeah, he's, he's got, he's, he's, a, he's such a fascinating person. 
Yeah, I, I, I haven't met him, haven't talked to him, but I just I love I love the way he expresses the stuff when he, in his in his writings. But and again, forgive my being a I had a squirrel moment. I took off on a tangent on you. You guys yeah, went. You guys. You guys went on. You went to the conference, and uh, you got. You yeah, got. You, you got. Yeah, anyway, you, you got hooked. Uh, yeah. Long story short, I fast forwarded. You know, the first night we're there, the curator of the event, you know, knew that we were newbies, uh-huh. but we looked like because we were out of place, but and we looked. I hate to say say normal because I think there's a lot of fascinating <laughs> people, but you could tell we weren't bigfooters. You know, yeah. and 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 he invited us. Mark, this is Mark DeWorth, invited us. He said, hey, what are you guys doing later? We, my wife and I went down to the bar to grab something to eat. And uh, he said, we've, we've got a, a dinner at one of the cabins that we host if you guys want to join us. And it was with the, the speakers. So, I mean, in this, so, so he was like, uh, yeah, sure. We, <laughs> you know, first night there. And, and we were sitting there at, in, a, in a really uh, laid back atmosphere and uh, sitting, you know, chatting with, you know, Dr. Jeff Meldrum. And Cliff Berrickman, uh, who was a star on Finding Bigfoot and has a Bigfoot museum in Boring, Oregon. Uh, James Bobo Fay, who was on the TV show of Finding Bigfoot with them. Uh, John Wilk. There's just a John Wilk, uh, Dr. Russ Jones. There's just there's just all these people there that are were speaking at the event or have been involved with this forever. And we just got thrown into it in the first night. So so that was kind of cool in itself, you know. And then you listen to the speakers. I think I think. Doc, like you mentioned, Dr. Jeff Meldrum, if you, me not just being uh, naive to the subject, uh, and I'm only going back probably four years, uh, I think it's maybe five tops. I mean, this year will be our fifth time going to that same event this upcoming May. And uh, you, here I said, I'm sitting there in the audience, and I said, and I'm listening to a scientist, and, I'm, and I, I said, wow, there's actually scientists that are, are looking into this. Right. PhD. And there has to be something to this. I said, you know, whatever it is. And then followed up by that, uh, Dr. Uh, not Dr. But Cliff Berkman had, a, you know, he studies footprints and he's, he's, uh, he's fascinating too. And I just, and he put on an articulate data driven and they're showing these trackways. And Dr. Jeff is talking about how he studied this trackway, you know, a trackway, as you know, as a hunter, isn't just one print, right? It's, a succession of prints and how you how you could tell it was the same foot although the toe lay different you know or the indentation was different on where it where it stepped so you could it could not have been faked because who's gonna have be able to change toes if it was, it was a stomper so it just made me scratch my head so yeah. Uh, that's kind of how I got into it, and I just from then on, I just you know, got you know, it, you know, I can, we can talk about what happened next, but yeah, that's what got me into it. It well, really got me thinking about it. Hey, let me ask you a quick question: Are you how's your cell service? You you cut out every once in a while on me. Uh, cell service is fine, but let me let me do this here. Um, I'm, I'm on a um, an ear an earbud. No, it's a it's a it's like a, a like a one of those conference room speakers. Oh, I got you. I, I can do this. This would be even better. How's that? Uh, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that Sorry, way. That, oh, you're okay. Hey, and just so you know, Delaware has five sightings of, of Sasquatch. Did you know that? I did. Yep. Yeah. And, and, yeah, and I think at least three of them are within five miles of where I live. Oh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. One of them that actually is basically about a quarter mile from me. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. This is like, I think you're the second or third uh person i've had on where we've talked about uh bigfoot or sasquatch uh we had tobe johnson and brett on from uh, flash of beauty the do- by, uh, bigfoot doc and of mm-hmm. course tobe tobe does a great program i listen to it all the time when i'm traveling it's called strange brow radio and they just started a new podcast uh, uh with uh, the doc involved in it but uh i mean tobe's tobe's done a lot of work on the west coast he's he's a really good he's a nice guy i've talked to him several times and then uh yeah, I, I enjoyed reading uh, everything that I've seen on you. I mean, as far as I, I can't wait to get your book. I appreciate you sending me that book. I'm going to read that while I'm turkey hunting this year. But you know, here's 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 some here's some questions I get, and I don't know how to answer them, Tim. So I'm okay. gonna, I'm going to throw them at you and see what you think. Okay. Sure. There's so many divisions uh, inside the the people that are that are researching this uh, the, the Bigfoot you know whether it's flesh and blood whether it's spiritual 
uh, interdimensional. Uh, I'm, I mean, I've heard, I've heard a lot of things, and you know, flesh and blood, I can wrap my head around that. I, you know, I can, I, you know, and as far as the spiritual side of it, you know, I'm a Christian, so I believe in God, and I believe, you know, I believe in, in Christ, and you know, there's a spiritual side to Christ. I mean, uh, I, you know, that uh, there, there's a, there's a side where. You know, when I talk to someone from the Native American uh, 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 clan, I hate to say it right. like that, but when I talk to a Native American and they talk about spirit animals and they talk about, you know, the spirits and stuff, I I, I don't have a problem with that myself. I think, I, you know, I think that that's, that's uh, you know, if I have to honor my belief, then, you know, I, who, you know who's to say that they... That isn't an existence, or that isn't into another dimension. I mean, Einstein proved that there's other dimensions. Mm-hmm. Was it Einstein, or was it string theory? It was. It was, uh, it was Einstein, wasn't it? Uh, you're, 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 uh, yeah, you're probably. Uh, what, I don't know if it was. No, it wasn't Einstein. It was, uh, and, and I'm, I, I may be wrong. Was it? Um, it was either string. Yeah. Th- it was one of them. So you know, so I, you know, I don't know. I don't know enough to to have a, uh, a, an informed debate on that. I do. I just know from all the hundreds of thousands of reports from all over North America uh, that people are there. They're. I mean, they're. They're actual there. I mean, that data is all there. You can go up on the uh, big. What is it? BMO. BF. BMR or B, uh, BFO. It's. It's. It's the the, the BFRO dot net. BFR. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Bigfoot researchers uh, organization. Okay. Thank field, you. Field researchers organization. So there's hundreds of thousands of people. I mean, and I, you and I talked about bears. I've been around bears for a long, long time, and you know, bears. You know, bears. I think are a lot of the missing uh, people are seeing a bear. They're either going up reaching for acorns, or you know, bears can be uh, bipedal. They can walk on two legs for short distances. So I think some of that is misidentifications. But I don't. Can they all be misidentifications? Right. That's, I think that's the most to me and to really, and, I, and I'm not an expert on the subject. I mean, I just happen to speak to multiple uh, individuals that are, are that study this. Yeah. And, and well, no, that's okay, but I want to know what they're telling you. I mean, because you're yeah, probably asking so, the same questions, right? Well, yeah, you know, you know I, I think that's the most fascinating piece of it is you, there's thousands and thousands or tens of thousands of, of reports. If you go on that to that BFO, BFRO website, which is the originate it's probably the original uh, website that started back in the 90s uh, by Matt Moneymaker is his name. And then since then, there's other research organizations that collect data, but that was the first one that really put it on and, and started doing it. You know, there were some handwritten, you know, there's others, individuals from earlier days that would collect reports and mm-hmm. keep files and such. But, but we only see, so if you go onto that website, all you are seeing is what's been posted and approved and, and interviewed. But there's thousands and thousands and thousands of other reports that that aren't on that website that they take that they just haven't either they they haven't flushed out or they haven't you know you know, they just haven't got to so there's others there that who knows how many of those that are, are in there. But there's so many thousands of reports and that's the most compelling thing is people are seeing these things in daylight, multiple people seeing them, seeing them up close, can they all be, you know, misidentify, it, defying it for something else? And I think that's that's pretty much the most compelling pieces of evidence. And, and actually, it's not only in North America. There's cases around the world. Oh, uh, Russia, about, Russia, everywhere. Yeah, Ru- yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and I've talked to primatologists, and and that's and even skeptic primatologists. Uh, there's there's one gentleman in the book, his name's Dr. Esteban Sarmiento, and he spent 20 years in Africa studying apes. That's what he did. He mm-hmm. was out in the woods following studying apes, and he said, hey, I don't know if I believe in Bigfoot until I see one or find compelling evidence. To sh- and he's been out, he's been in the Bigfoot world for a while and been studying some of the, the well-known uh, documented cases. But he said, there's got to be something to this. There's thousands of witnesses that see this. I mean, it just can't be all people hallucinating or misidentifying it so i think that's the most compelling piece of evidence and that that in the native american lore that there's it's you take every single tribe in north america i was just going to say that every single tribe's got a name for it mm-hmm. yeah and, and and 
yeah, that's just it's just you know we've got historical in, in the book. I've got I've got a great mix of people in the book. I've got scientists, I've got TV personalities, I've got hardcore researchers and groups, and then I have individuals that are quote unquote historians of the subject. So they are they're the they they go back and pull historical archives of newspapers, old books, and just have you know and there this goes back to the again to native americans a couple hundred years ago or longer and then they you've got you've got uh newspaper clippings from the you know from the 1800s you know as we were printing newspapers of right. people seeing what they call the wild man or they have different names of them and that's just interesting you know <laughs> yeah no i i think it's fascinating like i said and i i you know i always told everybody when we started the show it's okay to ask questions if we have a guest on if you guys message just keep it respectful you know, don't be don't be picking on anybody because I'm not going to acknowledge it if I see it. I, I think everybody has a, you know, everybody has a right to ask a question because that's why we're doing the show. I want to talk and I want to I want to communicate. Matt says he uh, he heard a, a howl last summer on his deck that was said it wasn't a coyote. It was deep, loud, and long. I'm well, glad Matt brought that up because uh, there are also individuals. I've got a couple in the book, and then I'll have a couple in the because there's going to be a volume two and probably about volume three. There are individuals that are, are cryptolinguists, which basically you know did that that you know, translated uh, did this for the government. Yeah, and and they study audio, and and they take these what's called a spectrogram, and they they take these sounds and they put them on the spectrogram, and they can visually see and they can rule out. All these other animals, they can, you know, then they, they, they go into this unknown category of what are, what are these sounds? And I've got a bunch of them that, that, I, that, that, so, so part of the book, what's a really cool, unique thing about the book and the book, and, and I, if you can bear with me for a second, the book's, the book is, uh, the publisher of the book is Doug Highcheck and Hangar One Publishing. And Doug Highcheck is a legend mm-hmm. in, the, in the Bigfoot world. He, he produced, uh, the documentary Sasquatch Legend Meets Science, which is probably Jeff Meldrum's breakout um, film. And then Jeff Meldrum wrote the book that the complimentary book to that documentary, same same title. And he Doug Highcheck produced Monster Quest and, and, and a bunch of he came, he started in, in like you. He started in the uh, he was a camera guy and he, he studied he was out in the woods studying animals and, and filming. He's he captured, he's got, he was the first one, and maybe there may only be two. Uh, Doug Hycheck, uh actually filmed a giant squid in swimming in its habitat. The first one to ever do that. Oh, I've seen that. I've seen that yeah, that's Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Doug. Yeah. And so he's the publisher of the book. So part of his idea of the book, we built QR codes in the book. And for, for and, and I, it took me a minute. I had to have to ask my kids. <laughs> <laughs> but a QR code basically you, <laughs> you can click this click this image yeah. this this code and it, it links you to something else. So so sprinkled through the book I've got QR codes and I've got audio. You can you can hear audio. You can see uh, I have some videos in there. I've got color photos. I've got statistics. A lot of cool bonus things in the book that really just really give it that little extra flair and it's a really cool thing but there's what i was going back to is there's tons of audience of the audience if you pick up the book you can click on some some sections uh david ellis is one of the gentlemen in the book who, st- who does this he studies audio and he sent me a bunch of different audio clips that you can actually see it you can see it so there's images of the spectrogram that you can see and then you can actually listen to the audio uh, that that he you know it's just it's just it's you know he can't say he can't prove or just say hey that was a bigfoot or a sasquatch or a wood ape depends on what you want to call him uh, although he can rule out a lot of anything else any other animal in North America so yeah, yeah. when you hear that he knows of yeah you know? I mean I've heard some I've heard some crazy things like bobcats and heat and stuff like that I mean they're uh-huh. They'll they'll get the hair on the back of your neck rising up. I mean, it, it's really spooky. So, but you know, like I said, uh, we we were talking about Ron uh, Mel, Mel, Mel Morehead. Morehead, thank you. And with these Sierra sounds, and mm-hmm. that's some of the craziest stuff I've ever heard in my life. And that and that actually was analyzed by a couple linguists, like you were talking mm-hmm. about, and they said that that wasn't a human faking that. Right. 
right yeah and it was it was uh, scott nelson as uh, i believe the 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 universe the academic that studied it amongst others and um yeah it's what do you say <laughs> yeah i don't know i don't know what it was i i uh but you know that's the thing so what what did you now when you guys got into this and you started talking did you ever go and did you ever go to an area that had reportings did you ever go sit out and listen or try to find if you could hear or see anything you know, not yet. Uh, unfortunately, I, I mean, I mean, well, we've gone out. So, so interesting enough is one of the areas that one of the the areas that we well the conference that we one of the conferences that we attend to every year, which is the Ohio Bigfoot Conference is, is, that we talked about earlier. Ooh. It's actually held. It's held at Salt Fork State Park, uh-huh. and that's that's got a history of sightings. So, it's one of the only places that you can go to a conference. And you can walk right outside of conference doors and walk in the woods, and you've got history there of Bigfoot. So, I mean, we've done that, but we haven't done any hardcore. Uh, there's a group uh, that, I, that I'm part of. It's, it's called the uh, North American Wood Ape Conservancy, mm-hmm. NAWAC. And uh, I'm, I'm, you know, in the upcoming weeks, they do they do some fascinating things. If you guys ever want to talk, if you want to talk about them, but uh, I mean, they're out in the woods for 16 or 17 weeks and they've got just some fast you know groups made up of former military law enforcement scientists and they've had multi i mean they've had just encounters and visuals and they think they may have shot one and it is just fascinating but then their their scientific approach to it their boots on the ground they they take a they they have an approach where they put people basically what they do is they'll take a group of you know you know two to four people and they'll they'll go into this area which they 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 designated area X and the reason they call it area X is because they just had a like an X Y and Z and just happened to be a, area X is the the most active one uh-huh. and they'll send a group in uh, and and again and these are woodsmen these some of them are biologists some of them are again former you know they're just all kinds of credible type people um, and they'll send a group in for for a week and then after and 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 they've got certain protocols and then after that week another another group will come in and relieve them and and so they'll do this so they're actually in the woods from you know from spring to fall consistently trying to collect data and 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 you know and do things out there so it's it's a, it's pretty interesting so anyway i may get down there here in, you know in, in this you know in the upcoming you know near future and, and maybe get out in the woods with those guys so yeah that would be cool all yeah. right it, we're visiting with tim holleran author of the book bigfoot influencers tim hang on i gotta take a real quick break and we'll be right sure. back on the unknown file show stay tuned no flippy floppy whether it's camping, hunting, or fishing, you want your camping setup to be easy in your state. What's up, guys? Pat, everybody. Camper Thanks for watching tonight, to listening. Outdoors as problem-free as possible since 1999. Camparite employees are outdoor enthusiasts that use and design each product to make sure your adventures are ones you'll want to remember. They carry great tents like the original tent cot that started it all. This fully enclosed off the ground. Jack, I honestly can't say it. Comfort of a standard sleeping I cannot say Bigfoot's real. Uh, and I've said that. I would love to see one if it was. But I just love talking to people about the subject that people have been out looking. And I love, uh, I just like having the conversations about it. I'm a hunter, man. You know, I, I, I've seen some, I've seen some crazy stuff. I haven't seen Bigfoot, but it would be neat to see something like that. So anytime on the web at campright.com. That's campright with a K dot com. Let's talk about a story, an Iowa story about a dream that took several years to come true in Osceola, Iowa. It's the story of Revelton Distilling Company. These fine distilled whiskeys. Oh. Who's ready for the Deer Classic? The labor of I'm ready. Christina Taylor. It's amazing hearing the customers. We need to get a squatch booth there sometime. That would be fun. And how each spirit tastes and satisfies with every sip. <laughs> From the honey whiskey to the whiskey and cream. Or the robust malt. I'm ready to go go turkey. I'm ready to get out and chase some turkeys. Revelton Distilling visitors can't believe the flavor profiles the mixologists are creating at the distillery every day. One more after this, guys. The distillery is open Wednesday through Sunday in Osceola. They're located at 1400 West Clay Street, right off I-35. Revelton Distillery Fine Spirits are also available at your local grocery and other retailers around Iowa. 
Please check them out online at rebeltedistillery.com or visit them at the distillery. If it's time to celebrate or just time to sit back and unwind, well, then it's time for a Rebelton moment. Heading on your next adventure and looking Last for one. some snacks to take, why not pack a snack that tastes great, gives you protein, and is easy to pack? Have you heard of Soldier Boy Beef Jerky? Soldier Boy Jerky is slow smoked in small batches to ensure generous, tender morsels that taste outstanding. Soldier Boy Beef Jerky offers the following flavors, sweet heat, original maple or peppered flavors that will satisfy you all day in the field. Soldier Boy Beef Jerky is veteran owned and proud supporters of the Canines for Warrior Foundation. They also donate to troops that are deployed serving our country. So next time you're looking for snacks from home or on your next outdoor adventure, please awesome be sure to reach for some Soldier Boy Beef Jerky available at Sportsman's Warehouse. Soldier Boy Beef Jerky, outstanding taste that keeps you satisfied in the field. For more information, please check us out online at www.sbjerky.com. All right, welcome back to the Unknown File Show. Hope everyone's having a great Wednesday on this 1st of March of 2023. My guest is Tim Holleran, and we're talking about the book Bigfoot Influencers and some of the stuff that's uh, in Tim's book. Tim, i got to ask you, what's some of your favorite chapters in the book? Uh, you know, it's, you know, some of the favorite things for me is some of the funny, you know, so what I, the, the book's an interview-style book, so basically... Each chapter is a, is an individual, so so I've got about 30, 30 individuals in the book, and every each and every chapter is based on a, a particular individual in the book. So I ask them questions. I ask um, some of them all the same questions, and other ones there might be something particular to their background, and I also ask them a few personal questions because I thought it might be uh, cool or fascinating just for the audience or the readers, just to, you know, to get a little bit. Uh, to know these people more than just what they see on TV or they hear on the radio or, or what they've read in books and they can get some personal things. So some of the stories are, are some of the, the accounts are fascinating and then some of the funny stories are great. So there's an individual, uh, his name is, his Lyle, Black, Lyle Blackburn, who actually wrote some books that you would probably be interested in, Dan. He wrote uh, The Legend of Walker Creek. He wrote a, wrote a book about Momo. Uh, and in Missouri, and and Lyle's also a musician, and and he's uh, he's got a band called Bull Town. But when he was in, I think it was seventh grade, uh, he was he dressed up as Gene Simmons for Halloween <laughs> in school. <laughs> so so he thought it was a great idea to yeah. borrow borrow his mom's you know her high heel boots. So he didn't think about that. He had to walk around school all day yeah. wearing his mom's boots. So, yeah. So that was just a hilarious story. You know, they, they kind of let their, their hair down a little bit. And oh, yeah. Personal things about them. So, so that was fascinating. Um, I think uh, there's a there's a, a group. Uh, I have I have two folks in the book, uh, Bob Strain and Kathy Strain. Uh, obviously, they're a couple. <laughs> are, are, is, that, it, is that the couple from Ohio? No, they're well. They're they're in California. Okay, okay. Yeah, uh, Ohio. I'm trying to think which couple that is. Well, I saw. I, I I was listening to one of Tobe's radio shows last year or something, and I, that's why I thought I knew who that was. But they actually had uh, they were having stuff happening uh, at their farm all the time. I mean, they were throwing getting rocks thrown at them, and uh, the, they were, they threw up security cameras. They could never get anything on camera. Uh, but they would always hear sounds or, you know, and their, their dogs would be freaked out. Um, I, I, I'm thinking of somebody else, evidently. But Yeah, that's okay. No. Uh, I, now you got me thinking. Uh, so, <laughs> so but, but Bob and Kathy Strain had a them and two other individuals, and they were down in southeast Oklahoma uh -huh. in, in, with the North American Wood Egg Conservancy. And they, they had a daytime sighting, and they, they saw two individuals, you know, I say individuals, two uh, alleged uh, Bigfoot, or they call wood apes in the group. And they were, they assumed one was, was, they were younger, but they had a daytime visual, and they chased them up a ridge, and four, four of them saw it. And, and they... How, they yeah, chased them up on. They were running after it, or dry, they tried. Dry. Yeah, yeah. The first thing Kathy did, and, and she she was the only woman there. She jumps up, and 
runs after him, and there are the others like, are you crazy? <laughs> and of course, they're so fast they weren't even they, yeah. they they didn't have a shot, but right. they all they all saw these two creatures running, and they saw them going, you know, and they they all got feet. They all saw certain features in them and how fast they were, and they saw them run up. And it was just nobody, nobody it's fascinating. Yeah, that's that is great. Matt wants to know. Uh, he wants me to ask you, what do you think about the series Expedition Bigfoot, and are those shows doing justice to the topic? You know, that's 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 a great question. And even going back to Finding Bigfoot, so I think I've asked I asked that question. Uh, I'll start with Finding Bigfoot folks uh, show because that came on earlier. So people asked that same thing with Finding Bigfoot. They thought it was a lot of people say hey, they make it look like it's a big joke. I I think. Uh, we all have to remember it's entertainment, um, and so they've got to get viewers. I think starting with Finding Bigfoot crew, I think they did their best to uh, not say anything that wasn't true, and and they and they had they they I know they fought with the producers, and they were able to look at the uh, before any episode was aired to make sure that they didn't, you know, basically make them look like idiots. Um, and so, so some people think that, Hey, they're making a joke of this. And there's some, some famous people said that, and that they're making, they, they're making this big joke, you know, but I think the bigger picture is it, it, it did bring more people into it and, and brought more awareness to, to the subject. Um, the expedition Bigfoot, I, I haven't spent enough time uh, of watching that. I, I did meet uh, a couple of the folks I, I, and I, I, a couple of the stars in there. Uh, I've chatted with Ronnie LeBlanc, who's one of the stars, and then I met uh, um, the doctor the, 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 that's there. She, I, I met her at one of the, um, the shows, and, and I don't know. I, I think from – I just know from what I hear, I think maybe they just had less um, – flexibility with the producers i think i think what happens on tv is is they you know we see what the, the producers and the editors want us to see and it may pull away from what the, those folks out there are really trying to do but well, I, I don't know them enough to, well you know. yeah here's the thing about tv you got 30 minutes you gotta you gotta have content so yeah. if you're going out there in a the field or the woods and nothing happens you gotta fill 30 minutes of content so that stuff's you know that's where you get in the shenanigans a little bit or you know stuff that's scripted so matt i i think that's a great question matt and uh you know i uh i mean tim i applaud you for asking him that you know i i quit i don't watch any of the bigfoot shows and i, I don't know if i've said that on the air on the show or not i i would rather go read the books mm -hmm. uh you know because i i just from doing tv for 20 something years i i know how much scription uh how much stuff scripted on tv because you're, you're you're constantly Per, you got to fill that content. One hundred percent, and I actually, I actually speak, speak with every individual in the book about that. Uh, it's one of the questions I ask: yeah. if you're, if you're any researcher, where do you start? Yeah. What books do you start with? And, and I think you've got to go back and, and, and read first. I mean, you can still watch the TV shows, but y you've got to know what happened historically because it it evolved to where it is today. Yeah. No, so you have to go back to the early researchers and the ones who wrote books. And yeah, and I'm not saying don't watch them, folks. I'm, yeah. You know, if you enjoy watching them, by all means, keep watching them. I'm not, I'm not saying anything negative about them. I just, from my own, for doing this show, to ask questions and stuff. I, I just, you know, I, I thought it would be better served if I didn't watch them. Uh, right. Right, and I have a list in the back of my book because I asked every researcher what books they would recommend. So I took all their suggestions and compiled it. And there's yeah. a lot of the same suggestions, so that's kind of a cool thing. You kind of give because individuals are new enthusiasts that are interested and they're new to the subject, or right. even if they're not, they say, "Where do I start? What yeah. books do I start with? Or how do I get involved with this? What do I do?" So, and that's kind of was what happened with me with writing this book. It was a personal quest. I. You know, I went to some of these conferences, I listened to podcasts, I might watch documentaries, and there's so many people out doing, doing fascinating, compelling research, and I would listen to someone, you know, you, you know, like, even on your, you know, someone like, like Tobe, and I'd say, wow, I never heard of him before, but yeah. he's doing all these amazing things, and I, and, and I said, wouldn't it be great for people to have a place they can go and kind of get a start? 
like say not I hate to say the who's who because there's more for my book there's more than just those people obviously that have impacted the subject but I said what if it's almost like a directory of hey here's where you start if you buy it and uh, so for the audience that's listening if you if you buy this book it'll give you a good foundation of of, of some of the, the things some of the people uh, that have have influenced and impacted the subject and it gives you a kind of a good foundation of of what's going on out there. And then obviously there's going to be multiple volumes because I only scratch the surface on, on the folks that are, are doing, doing, you know, amazing things out there. So oh, I bet. Hey, uh, Shiloh, uh, Shiloh Douglas said, I think there's a lot of different people, uh, that are seeing things that can't be explained or that can, can they find, uh, or they can find that in the Bible says of celestial, celestial is of good and, uh, terrestrial is of evil. Shiloh, there's actually in, in the Bible uh, the the, the uh, Tim help me out the Nephilim, Nephilim, yeah, ne- Nephilim. That's there's actually stories in the Bible about giants, Nephilim, right? Yeah, there definitely is is some correlation, yeah. uh, historical biblical correlations to, to giants, and and again, I'm not a, a biblical scholar, but you know, I, I the story is I think they were fallen angels. Uh, that um, bred with women, and that's where the Nephilim came from. I think that's, I, and again, I could be totally, no, I may no. only be half right, but I think that's, that, that's, a, that's a, I think the, the base of it. Yeah, well, that's actually more than I knew. So there you go. I learned something <laughs> new tonight. But I, I just knew that there was something in there about giants, and, and uh, uh, which is, you know, here's the thing. We, you know, until, until you find unequivocal uh, proof, a hundred percent. I know that that uh, Dr. Melba Kefchen, I, I think I'm saying her name right. She uh-huh. she did the DNA analysis a couple of years ago, and that came up inconclusive. Um, uh, and then, according to some people, it came back where they it, it was something that was never been identified before. So it's it depends on who you talk to. Right, right, right. And yeah, and I think what some some say, even like Dr. Meldrum has said that they didn't do enough. You know, they studied certain uh, air, certain scientific DNA. They did certain DNA tests, but they didn't do enough of them. So yeah. it, they didn't. They didn't dive in deep enough with that study, is what some say. So, so. Well, I know. I, I, I know. There's people still trying to try to get that done. You know, I mean, if yeah. that would that would be one way. I mean, if they're that elusive, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, if they can detect. EMF, or if they can, if they can pick up like other animals can pick up uh, stuff that you know you and I talked about that earlier tonight. I know deer, and I know turkey, and I know bear can they can sense EMF fields, that electric, uh, electronic, or electric magnetic fields, or EMF, however you say it. I know those animals can sense it. I mean, hex. Everybody that pretty much hunts knows or heard of hex suits, uh, and mm-hmm. e- even in the even in the people that go diving, go scuba diving, they wear hex. Uh, um, uh, uh, gosh, I can't talk tonight, Tim. <laughs> yeah, wetsuits. Thank you. They wear they wear they wear they wear wetsuits with the heck technology because sharks can detect EMF. They've got they've got little little uh, little amples of like little cones and amples of fluid in their nose called uh, amples of Lorenzini, and they can they can actually detect a, a, a fish or a ray or something's electrical magnetic field. That's how they feed. Uh, they can sense that, and those hex suits can block that. So, who's to say that if if Bigfoot or Sasquatch is real, who's to say that they can't detect that as well? Right. You know, it's it's, it's compelling enough to, to to look into. Yeah, I I know enough just to get myself in trouble, Tim. Well, I'm just I'm just, I'm just telling you as a hunter. I mean, I've you know you and I, I told you the story before uh, to the earlier when we spoke. I had a, I had a really nice buck coming in. I mean, the wind was totally in my face. A deer's best defense is their nose and their ears. Um, they got pretty good eyesight, but their nose and their ears. They can. Uh, I, I've talked to I don't know how many biologists in 25 years of doing the the outdoors dam shows. You know, they they can smell a human up to 300. Uh, 300 yards away. That's how prolific their sense of smell is. Bears are even have an even better nose than a deer, 
But uh, you know, you you got the wind in your face. There's no way your scent's getting out there, and that buck all of a sudden will just stop and look look down your way. And I'm 20 feet up in a tree, right? And I didn't move. I didn't move the camera, but that buck just kept staring, and all of a sudden it just turned around and walked the other way. And he saw something, and he saw me or saw my EMF in the tree. Um, because here's the thing: a tree limb that moves. You know, a deer will sit there and keep feeding. It won't pay any attention to it. But but a predator, uh, a coyote or a bobcat or a mountain lion or a human, if you move, they see that EMF field. I, I believe that 100% when the biologists tell me that. Hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah. That definitely is. But their head's on a swivel because they're 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 the prey. Well, absolutely, so. man. I tell you, the, the weariest creature in the woods, in my humble opinion, is a white-tailed doe, a female deer. That do, that she is always checking the air. She's always looking around, and she's got those ears, just always scanning, you know, to hear something. Hey, uh, Tim, I, I knew this hour was going to fly by. We got about ten <laughs> minutes left. Uh, Ain't no problem. So, uh, hey, what's um, you know, we talked about some of the goals for the, the chapters, and uh, what about the images? What can people see in the book? What what kind? Of, I love pictures. What can they see? So I actually have some one of a, some, I've got some images uh, in the books that were provided by some of the individuals in the book yeah. uh, that are uh, Daniel Perez and, and Richard Knoll. And there, uh, Richard uh, sent some images that some photos that have never been released before. So they're 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 historical photos, and they're just unique because they he's, they've never been published before. And then again, with the QR codes, you can actually see the the color image. You know, in the book, the book's black and white, right? So you're only getting so much detail. But uh, with the QR codes, I've got it built in where they can actually see the, the color images. So so the images are fascinating. I've got some fascinating charts. So there's a couple individuals that helped me uh, in the book, and they created a data set of um, just uh, looking at the map of the U.S. and looking at hot spots and looking at reports and just data around that. Uh, one group's called Squatcher Metrics, and the other one's PNW Maps. And then uh, there's just some fascinating, uh, some some data in there that just it just makes you scratch your head. Yeah, there, are you familiar with a company called Onyx? O N X Onyx Hunt. Yeah. It's a it's an app that you can download on your phone, but it basically gives you all of the uh, all of the GPS locations or all of the uh, geographical information of North of North America. So, like if you're going out to a range, you can pull up the the property that you're on. You can see who owns the property next to you. You can go find trails in national parks, BLM, uh, you know, which is a public ground uh, national park ground. Uh, you should check that out because I, I, will. I when I talked to Onyx. The guys there at Onyx said that they've actually talked to so many people that are going out doing Bigfoot uh, uh, research and going out trying to find things that they actually got a Bigfoot uh, emoji or a Bigfoot, uh, uh, not emoji, but... Uh, but uh, and, yeah, something to plug in to show where the sighting Yeah, what's, what's that called when you got your, like, a little... Uh, little uh, Graphic, maybe. Yeah, sure. yeah. it's uh, oh gosh darn it! It's is it emoji? Yeah, I, mean, I guess it could. Uh, it's got a little. It's got a little Bigfoot yeah. icon that you yeah. could put on there to mark like I saw a Bigfoot track right here. Wow. So I mean, yeah. so even mainstream, even mainstream companies are getting into this a little bit. Yeah, I, definitely. I, I, I'm gonna throw. To, I'm gonna throw out a theory to you. What? And you tell me if you think I got it. If you think this is reasonable or not, I think. You know, we just had all this UFO stuff released, right? For years, the, the government was saying UFOs were bogus. It was weather balloons, blah, blah, blah. Well, then all of, all of a sudden, uh, COVID hit, and then they started releasing these fighter pilot footages of these flare cameras that showing uh, UFOs that they can't catch up to. So they don't know what it is. It's an unad- they're not saying they're flying saucers from Mars, but they're, 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 show- it's, they're saying that there is something there now. What do you think that the government already knows about big that they know that this is there because one thing that I that I've noticed and just some of the stuff that I've been researching I don't see where the government ever interviews any of these people that encounter anything that related to Bigfoot. Have you noticed that? Right, yeah, and and I can just speak for the individuals I I, I have talked to and uh, the, I so the general consensus just from again my opinion and from what the opinion of the individuals I talked to is they don't think there's a collective effort 
a, to to uh, an organized effort to to, to hide this. Uh, although they, they, you know, they're you know, if someone's in a park, they've reported to the park ranger. Yeah. Or they they call the police department, and they and and, and sometimes they keep these records, sometimes they don't. But there's not an official quote unquote database of these reports by the government so you know so if you and i are out, the, out camping and and we have something happen to us and we go to the park ranger and we report it sometimes it just goes in a file sometimes it gets thrown away they just there's no database around it uh, so so we most think that the government does know about it and there's stories about military shooting them and there's there's a ton of stories out there and 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 seem credible but you know i don't you don't know unless you you know unless you were there i guess you know tim and, here, tim yeah. here, here's what i'm thinking and this is just my own little conspiracy theory. I think they do know. And I, if it ever comes out where un, unequivocal proof that it, it, you know, people know this is really, this is really, they're really out there. What do you think is going to happen to a lot of these forest areas and stuff? Because mm-hmm. they're going to, they're going to zone these off where people can't go because they're going to say they're protected species. And they don't want to lose the revenue from the logging and all that. I think, part, I think some of that's, you know, I might be off the wall. But I think some of that's that's why they're not involved more than they are. No, there are many who feel the same way, and that's that's one of the biggest reasons why they folks think that the government is not making this public is because of the logging, the multi-billion-dollar logging industry, or or the force that that get the tourists come in. Yeah. and they've got to protect the land. You know, get, everyone goes back to the spotted owl. Yeah, was, yeah, spotted yeah. Owl. yeah, remember that mess. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. I, so, so that that's I think that's the biggest reasoning that that uh, most individuals feel that the government is is not coming forth with it because of that. And, well, you know, I'm glad I'm not the only one that thinks that. You're yeah. not. Yeah. You're not. You're definitely not. Yeah, because you know sometimes when I'm sitting out there waiting for something to come by to fill a tag, and I, the, the 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 deer and the turkey often outsmart me, Tim. I mean, that's just the way it is. I I lose more and I win. Trust me. But while I'm out there waiting. It's amazing what ponders through my little pea brain sometimes. Well, so so you remember? I mean, your audience probably knows who Action Jackson is. Action the Jackson. Fam- Action for the famous uh, park ranger from Yellowstone. I don't know if I know who that is. Sorry. So he's you know he's you know thirty or so years as the most famous park ranger probably in the U.S. Really. And he uh, and he I, I don't know if he came out after he retired. But uh, he had a Bigfoot sighting. Really? And, and he, here's a guy who, who, who protected grizzlies um, and um, knows what he's looking at in the woods. And uh, it's just, uh, you know, you got, you've got a lot of credible people. And, that, uh, and going back to that, that's some of the individuals that, uh, that, that you scratch your head when you have law enforcement and, and, and biologists – Skilled observers and park rangers and and that that know what they're looking at hunters you know and and they say not to make any you know if you and I are camping and we're just normal campers and don't see it too not to make us less credible but there's a lot of individuals that um, you know have these sightings and what do you say these are people used to being in the woods they know what a bear looks like and and they and then again Action Jackson Bob I think it's Bob Jackson is his name okay. He uh, he was he was a grizzly guy from Yellowstone, and he's he was his job. He, he used to chase, chase poachers out of Yellowstone, and he traveled by horseback, you know, hundreds and hundreds of miles. Well, that's what he did, and he had I, I know at least one Bigfoot sighting. Tim, I, I want to thank you. That gives me something to, to research for the next week. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, I I'm pre- looking at here. Look, big. If you go into the BFRO, yeah, it's report uh, one. One two three zero two. One two three zero two. Yeah, uh, Yellowstone backcountry uh, ranger describes sighting and other incidents. All right, that's awesome. Yeah, hey. pretty cool. in Wyoming. Yeah, I guess he's in Wyoming. Well, we didn't even talk about Survivor Man. You got Survivor Man yeah. in your book, and we we're gonna have you back on. I, I you got we'll get you back on here after turkey season, and uh, we'll visit some more about the book and uh, and. Some of the new projects you got going on. I apologize. I knew this was going to fly by. Yeah, definitely. It was an honor to be here, though. No, so. it's, it's totally my privilege. Thank you. Tell everybody. Okay, let's uh, f- let's see if they want to listen to the podcast. What's the best place for them to listen to it? The best place for the podcast, which is a podcast, is the extension of the book. We we interview you know 
these influencers, uh, you can go to the Untold Radio Network, and there's a group. There's about eight or nine podcasts within the group, and and you can find the Bigfoot influencers. If you Google search the Bigfoot influencers, I'll come up. You can you can find my website. I've got links to all all the the podcast the book and all that. And if you want to buy the book, you can buy it. You know, you can buy it at Amazon. Uh, Barnes and Noble, all the, the national outlets. If you want to support small business, on my website I've got links to the small businesses that have uh, have the book. Uh, some of them have autographed copies of the book. Uh, you can reach out to me on social media. Just type in the Bigfoot Influencer on any social media outlet, and you'll be able to find me. And uh, yeah, say hello. I, I just this has been an honor. Uh, Dan, I mean, I'm just so so thrilled to be here. I thank you so much. Well, let's, we'll have you we'll have you on again. Kenny Cole said, "Great show tonight." So that's all you, Tim. Thank you, Kenny. Yeah, you, that's all you, man. Hey, uh, and next time I have you on, see, I I wanted to talk about Ape Canyon tonight. We didn't even get mm-hmm. to that. Are you familiar with that? I am, and actually, yeah, that's I yeah I I am, and the gentleman. There's another gentleman that his name's Mark Marcel that really dives in Ape Canyon. He'll be in my second book, but Mark's a friend of mine, and, and it's definitely, that's a fascinating story. But you know what? Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind, next time when we get you on, can we get both of you guys on at the same time? I'm sure we can work something out. Yeah. That, that would be great. Um, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll send you some dates. I know you're busy, and you just uh, you tell me when we can make it happen, and we'll do that. So, hey, Tim, uh, give my best to your wife, please, and, uh, well, and tell them again how they can find you on social media. Uh, so, yeah, uh, the Bigfoot Influencers on Facebook, uh, on Instagram. I think it's BF Influencers on Twitter. Uh, but just if you look up the BigfootInfluencers.com, there's links to everything on there from the podcast to social media to the book. So uh, you guys, it's, I'm pretty easy to find. <laughs> there you go. Tim, thank you, buddy. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. There, there he goes, Mr. Tim Holler. And uh, the book is called Bigfoot Influencers. And I knew that show was going to go quick. I really did. Hey, uh, that's going to wrap it up. We're going to be at the Iowa Deer Classic Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Come out. Larry Mack and I will be there. Andrew will be there. Uh, I believe Ken and the gang are going to be there. So uh, come on by and say hi, Booth 905. we got a bunch of stuff to give away uh, for you to try to enter and win. Uh, we got some turkey packages. And, uh, you know, we can always talk a little squatchy stuff, too. And, uh, I, you know, listen, I don't I don't make a dime on doing this show. I, I had somebody ask me, how much are you making doing this? I'm doing this because I love it. I just love it doing the show, um, you know. And I, what that was the nice thing about the Outdoor Call Radio app. It allows me to go on live and do. Uh, do I can do a show anytime I want, and that's where uh, that was the availability for me to do the unknown files. So uh, this is just this is just me and you guys talking and having a good conversation, and I'm having as much fun uh, doing it as hopefully you guys are uh, listening to it. So. I'm going to say goodnight to my audience on the Outdoor Call Radio app. You guys, I'm sending it back to scheduled programming, so you guys go there. And uh, I'm telling you what, we'll see you next time in the great unknown right here on the Unknown Files Show. All right, gang, we are off the air. That's awesome. Hey, thanks, everybody. I appreciate it. I had a high school science teacher named Tim Holler. There you go, Eric. I wonder if it's the same guy. That's awesome. Hey, Eric, thank you for, uh, thanks for helping me have a great deer season last year, man. Them Luminox, man. I got both of my bucks. Thank you, pal. I appreciate you over there in Illinois doing your, doing your hoodoo that you do do. Thanks, buddy. Hey, thanks, everybody. We'll be back again next week. Uh, same squashy time, 7 p.m. If you got something going on. Hey, if you got a story, if, you got, if you've had something happen to you that you just can't explain, go to the outdoorcallradio.com. That's the website. My email's right there. At the bottom of the page, you'll see my big email thing. Email me, and I'll get a hold of you, and uh, we'll have a conversation. So, Because I'm doing this for you as much as I'm doing it for me. So thanks, everybody. Have a great night. And uh, we'll see you live at the Iowa Deer Classic on Saturday. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.